Blessings, everyone. Thank you for joining me. It's an honor to have as my guest, Father John Whiteford. He is a Russian Orthodox priest right in Texas, Father? That's right. Okay. Are, are you in the Houston area? That's right, just to the north. If Houston had a toupee, it would be Spring, Texas. Okay. <laughs> now, are you are you a Texas native or... Well, I was born in California, actually, but oh, uh, you're my kidding. father was from Texas, so I claim uh, inheritance rights. <laughs> Where in California were you born? I was born in Riverside, but uh, lived in uh, Grand Terrace, which is outside of Colton, if you know where that's at, which is near San Bernardino. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice, nice. How, how did you end up in Texas? Was it was it through the church or your, your parents? Well, your... When I was uh, six, my parents got divorced. Sorry. And my father, I, I did child support for like 15 years with the state of Texas. So I got to see how things were as an adult <laughs> and how people do each other. But my father exercised his visitation to the T. So I actually saw him more after they got divorced than wow. I saw him, you know, uh, when, when they were still married. It kind of drove my mother crazy. So she moved me and my four brothers first to uh, Western Kentucky where her mother had retired, but it was a horrible place to move economically. Mm. So after about a year and a half, we moved to Houston. Now, were you um, born Orthodox or, or some other religion? Or? I was raised in the church of the Nazarene, which uh, okay. I used to tell people they're like conservative Methodists with Baptist tendencies, but now they're more like moderate Methodists with Baptist tendencies. Okay. Okay. How, did, was there any orthodoxy in, in your family at all or no? No. So ha, how my, did, my, sorry. Through my, my maternal line, I was a fifth generation Nazarene. My father was Church of Christ, but by the oh. time I came along, he was one of these. Uh, if you know people from church, the, the, these are the Campbellite Church of Christ folks. And you, you, you sometimes run into people who are sort of disillusioned with uh the church because they feel like they've been treated badly. So he still had his faith and he knew his Bible really well, but he didn't go to church hardly unless he went to church with my mother, hmm. which wasn't very often. If you don't mind me asking to make a, 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 a long story short, how, how did you, how did you come to orthodoxy? I was actually studying to be a Nazarene minister. Wow. And uh, one thing I discovered when I started studying theology academically that it was that even though you wouldn't know it on the ground level that the nazarenes had some appreciation for tradition at least on a theoretical level because they came from the methodists who came from the anglicans so they they had this the anglicans have the concept of the three-legged stool of anglicanism and um john wesley added one extra leg to that three-legged stool and so the, the, the wesleyan quadrilateral as it's referred to is the idea that scripture is primary, but the main interpreters of scripture are tradition, reason, and experience. And so uh, I thought at one point, because I was doing a paper on the inspiration of scripture, my professors were far more liberal than uh, the denomination was at that time. And they, did, they didn't believe in inerrancy by a long shot. I thought, well, I'm going to, we were supposed to all write a paper on our view of uh, the doctrine of inspiration, I thought, well, let me use this Wesleyan quadrilateral that we hear so much talk about and actually try it out. And um, so I, when I started digging into tradition, that's when I, I, I had this insight at a certain point that, you know what, if the church has always believed something, it has to be true. <laughs> and uh, I also met an Orthodox priest through the pro-life movement, and I didn't have any theological conversations with him until I was researching this paper because I was able to find a lot about what the Catholics believed and what the various branches of Protestantism believed, at least the main historic branches. But I thought, well, you know, the Orthodox Church is a pretty significant church in the history of the church, so mm. let me see what they think. So I called uh, uh, Father Anthony Nelson uh, up and uh, struck up a conversation and asked him about the Orthodox understanding of inspiration. And the way he explained it wound up being the way I argued the paper because it made the most sense and also happened to match stuff that I was finding in the fathers. And um, basically one thing what led to another, I, out of that conversation, I asked him to recommend a couple of books on orthodoxy. 
and he recommended Becoming Orthodox by Father Peter Gilquist and Orthodox Dogmatic Theology by Father Michael Pomazansky. <laughs> so those are my first two books on orthodoxy. Hmm. And then the rest is history. Right. I, I studied orthodoxy for about a year, and I didn't even talk to my wife about it oh. at first because I didn't want to confuse her if I wasn't sure that's what I wanted to do. So by the time I finally became convinced that orthodoxy was the way, then I told her about it, but she had a lot of catching up to do. Wow. <laughs> so wow, it took wow. her a little bit longer, but I was baptized in 1990 and she was baptized on bright Saturday in 1991. Wow. Now, are there many Orthodox in, in Texas? You know, I always think of Texas as being kind of maybe part of the Bible belt a bit. Well, it, it is part of the Bible Belt, especially East Texas, where I live. But uh, um, there are a lot of Orthodox. There's a lot of people who moved into the area that are Orthodox, but there's also a lot of people who've been converting. Yeah. So like in my parish, I would say about half of the adults come from an Orthodox background. And, um, you know, some of them are more recent arrivals. Some of them, you know, their families have been in the United States or Canada for, you know, maybe a generation or two. Uh, but, uh, but then we have the converts. So it, it's a, it's a, it's a good mix. And we're, we're, we're starting, what we're starting to see is, is people who are cradle Orthodox, but they're the children of people who converted to Orthodoxy. So that's another phenomenon that we're starting to see. Wow. Yeah. I, I, I was raised Roman, well, marginally Roman Catholic and then left the church, but and I never knew much of anything about orthodoxy, but but here I was in San Francisco, and we have such a rich history with St. John Maximovich. Right, right. Father Sarah from Rome. So it, it's cool. I've got, to, I've got to rediscover all. Or not rediscover, I got to discover mm -hmm. all that. There certainly is a lot more of a density of orthodox people in California along the West Coast and on the East Coast than you find in the middle of the country, but it's it's growing a lot. When I first moved back to Houston after I became Orthodox, I was going to college in Oklahoma. When I first moved back, there were there was only one Rocor parish in the entire state of Texas, and now we have I think ten or eleven. Oh, and uh, and in the Houston area, there was maybe about half or less of the churches that we now see. I, I think maybe it's about a third of the parishes that currently exist. Uh, so it's 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 been growing a lot. That's good. <laughs> now, how, how um, I got to know you and your work, I think it was through Twitter. And there's always just a, a network of, of Orthodox people on Twitter that, uh, you know, retweet people's tweets and things. So I think somehow I don't I don't know what the pathway was, but right. I, I, I read something that you had written and then I went to your blog and well i had read what you wrote i thought well this is interesting i like what he has to say so sometimes you don't read more but but i did so i said i want to read more so i saw that you have written quite a bit on a, a subject that you know preoccupied a lot of my time in roman catholicism and that's homosexuality but but more specifically things like queer theory and queer right. theology. And I didn't really want to broach this subject again as, as an Orthodox Christian because I, right. you know, I'd gotten away, away from it. And, um, but, you know, reading your work, um, I thought, well, I, I think I might have something to add to this. And, and I wanted to talk to you. So, right. so that's, that's why I'm here. One, one of the main problems, and I'm going to read a quote from you that I really liked. Uh, one of the main problems I had with Roman Catholicism in terms of this topic was that they have some very specific things that they say about homosexuality. Um, um, for instance, um, what, the main, the main, the main statement that they have in the catechism is that, you know, homosexual desires are not necessarily a sin, but to act on those desires is. Right. Um, but what I found out 
is it on the pastoral level, you know, when you're catechizing people, that was not what was being taught. What was being put forward by Catholic priests and a lot of lay people who were um, catechizing or miscatechizing people was the the church's the Roman Catholic Church's stance on this issue is in flux. It's in transition. It's changing. So I had a, I had a problem with that because at the time I didn't see that. That was under um, John Paul the second and Ratzinger, or excuse me, under Benedict fifteenth, and then but. And I should I should back up, Father. I don't want to take up too much time because I want to hear from you. But you know, I was doing a lot of apostolic missionary work and outreach in the gay community in San Francisco, and and um, I thought, well, this is misinformation what the Catholic Church is is putting it out there. But then when f- the pontificate of, of Francis began, and as it progressed um, or regressed, whatever. Um, th- that argument was for me was getting harder to make because it really looked like the church's stance on this issue was changing, and and I talked to people in that community who weren't necessarily Catholic or exploring Catholicism, but they were coming to the same conclusion that things were were changing. Well, before I read quote from you what as um what does orthodoxy teach on the subject of homosexuality and is there any difference say between like oca the church uh, orthodox church in america and roll Corps, which is church i belong to and you do the russian orthodox church outside america is there any difference or are they pretty much on the same page with with this issue yeah, I'm not aware of anything the OCA has said on the subject that would be different than what the uh, Russian Church Abroad would say. Now, you have some people in the OCA who said some different kinds of stuff, uh, but they, you know, they, their their uh, All Americans Council just issued a pretty strong statement that uh, I, I was happy to see because they basically said that whether you're a clergyman or a layman, if you if you are publicly contradicting what we teach then uh, then you're going to be held accountable and i just hope that they actually do that because th- it should have gone without saying because it's not like this is a new thing that the church has never encountered before um and uh, and they've had priests and you know laymen that uh, have made all kinds of outrageous statements in public and it just seems like something should have been done about it but uh, I'm glad that they've done it. Now, you know, of course, Rokor, I think, has taken a pretty strong position, but we still have Sister Vasa running around. But I do think that the fact that she was publicly rebuked by our Senate of Bishops has caused her to be at least a little bit more circumspect who, who on is the that? subject. Who is that, Father? Sorry to interrupt you. Sister Vasa is a nun who's, uh, she she's living in Vienna, and she's she was, um, a student of, uh, oh, his name's escaping me, but he's a very well-known Roman Catholic Jesuit uh, liturgical scholar. And uh, so that's her area of expertise is um, uh, liturgics. But uh, I think that, you know, rubbing elbows with uh, uh, post-Vatican II Roman Catholics has not been without some negative effects in her thinking and uh, so she issued she she had an article that she wrote a couple of years back where supposedly some mother who was a Byzantine Catholic had wrote her and said, you know, I've got a 14 year old boy who's told me he's a homosexual. And, uh, you know, what should I do? You know, how should I handle this? So she wrote this response in which she said, well, you know, it's not realistic for you to think that he's not going to you know, want a date and stuff like that. So it was basically, you know, like, you make, it'd be better for him to do it at home than to go out there and do it some, you know, God knows where. Uh, It was just horrible advice. 
and and uh, you know, I wrote a response to her in which I I said, you know, what what would happen if a you know what would we say to a mother of a fourteen year old boy who came out as a heterosexual and said, hey, I want to have sex with my girlfriend? Would you know what what Orthodox Christian would be told by anyone with any sense anyway? Would just get him a you know box of condoms and some you know some lubricants and uh, you know you make sure he does it in a safe place. You would never say that. And that's that's ridiculous. And the idea that 14 year old boys are incapable of uh, restraining themselves is belied by the lives of the saints, because uh, it just so happened that the Sunday after her sister Vasa had wrote this, uh, that, that Sunday was the feast of St. Hyacinth. Uh, and he was a 13 year old boy who was trying that the, the pagan Romans were trying to get him to offer to eat food sacrificed to idols and so they would put food that had been sacrificed to idols in his prison cell and he starved to death rather than eat that food and uh, and there's no more natural desire that a human being has than the desire to eat except maybe the desire to breathe air and to drink water you know that you know, i suppose you can put those a little higher up on the totem pole but uh and, and I, you could easily see how he could have rationalized going ahead. Well, I guess, you know, this is the only food I've got available. And, you know, St. Paul says that meat sacrificed an idol is nothing because an idol is nothing. But the early church took a strong position that despite how some Protestants read what St. Paul said, that, 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 that we Christians were not supposed to knowingly eat food that had been sacrificed to idols. And so this 13-year-old boy starved to death rather than to violate that and yet we're supposed to believe that 14 year old american boys are just so out of control that we have to let them have sex with whomever they want as much as often as they want uh it's, it's just ridiculous and so she said this and the senate of bishops slapped her down but i think they should have clipped her wings all together i i i think they should have told her and and i the one complicating factor is her father is a very respected archpriest who's like 90 years old or 80 years old and he's close to dying. And I think that maybe they just didn't want to cause him any more grief by being harder on her at the time than they needed to be. But it just, it, it seems to me that it wouldn't be an unreasonable thing. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be harsh to just say, look, you can be a, a, a nun or you can be an internet celebrity that says, you know, stuff that we don't like. <laughs> but you can't be both because to be a nun is not to be an internet celebrity. Um, and she, she's actually like a Rossifor nun, which is like one step beyond a, being a novice. And she's been a Rossifor nun for something like 20 years or more at this point. Being a Rossmore nun is not supposed to be the final destination of your journey in a, as a monastic, but she's not living in a convent. And uh, her whole life revolves around uh, her YouTube channel and, you know, selling paraphernalia associated with it. And um, it just seems very incongruous uh, to, to me. Uh, and, and the thing of it is, I think she hangs on to being a nun because no one would care what Vasa Lauren had to say. Exactly. But, but, but if, if, it, if it's Sister Vasa, who's a nun in Rokor, uh, that somehow gives her some credibility that she wouldn't otherwise have. It, it gives people like that an, a narrative, yeah. Right. But she hasn't made any outrageous statements on the subject of homosexuality since the bishops shut her down on that. Good. But she she does occasionally still say some stuff that I think that she, she still should probably have her wings clipped for. Okay. Um, yeah, it's it's unfortunate because when people like that um, occupy a position of respect and authority, they can confuse um, and deceive a lot of people. No doubt. I mean, the, the, the thing of it is, she's not only a, a Rasapur nun in Rokor, but she is a, a, a scholar. Yeah. And so I could see how a lot of people could listen to her and say, well, look, she knows what she's talking about. Yeah. So, and so you know, we, we, we can't just dismiss what she's saying. And I'm I'm not saying everything she says is wrong. I mean, I actually, a lot of people in Rokor really appreciated what she used to do with her YouTube channel because it was mostly 
answering people's questions and explaining the services and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And uh, our diocese paid to have her come speak to our St. Herman's conference when, <laughs> when uh, my oldest daughter was still a teenager. And so our parish paid money to send kids to go hear her talk. But, you know, as time went on, though, she just seemed to get off the rails. Mm. Well, she's in my prayers. Yeah. Um, the This is a quote from you, Father, and I thought this was really good. And I thought this really encapsulated um, my interest in this topic. But I think a lot of things that have, can and have gone wrong here I, I don't recall where this was from I, somebody it wasn't an article whoops i dropped some it wasn't an article that you wrote but it was an article that somebody interviewed you and you said the quote the problem in the orthodox church in the united states today is not that we are ignoring homosexuality it is that so many in our church are failing to take a clear stand on what we actually teach on the subject and instead choose to focus on how compassionate we ought to be to homosexuals to the exclusion of clarifying whether or not the church considers homosexual sex to be incompatible with the Christian life. And this is where, because I, I think there are people in the religious life um, Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, who do have a, a genuine care and concern for people um, with same-sex attraction, gay or LGBT. But I think where it, like you say, where, where it goes off the rails is when it becomes complicit and it becomes accommodating. And right. that's that's the problem. And, and I know it's a fine line, and I've done it too, as somebody that's outreached to these people, is it you, you got to be caring and compassionate, but you also have to be truthful. And being truthful is being caring and compassionate. If right. you're if you're if you're lying to people, or you're bending the truth, or you're obfuscating, or you're only telling part of the story, then that's that's not being caring. Right. And the thing of it is, I think at this point in our history, probably everybody knows people who are homosexual or struggling with homosexuality and we love them and we would like to fix the problem for them. You know, we would like to make it all okay, but there is a tendency for some people to want to fix it by saying, well, maybe it's not so bad. Especially parents. Right. And and that's, that's not being compassionate. If you believe what the scriptures teach, what the church teaches, because St. Paul says in, in first Corinthians chapter six, that certain groups of people are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And among those, he mentions uh, arsenicoiti, which would be the word for homosexuals uh, based in Levit It's a based on the Septuagint translation of Leviticus, the, the text that says a man should not lie with a man as with a woman. It's an abomination. So arsen means man and koiti or koiti means lie. And it's, it's, it's basically a word derived in Greek from the Aramaic, similar constructed word that the Jews use. You find this in Jewish writings. And there's also another word that sometimes also translated as homosexual called Malachi or Malakoi, depending on whether you have a Erasmian pronunciation or not. But uh, that word literally means soft people. And um, what that word is actually referring to is men who would uh, feminize themselves for the purposes of having sex with men. So sometimes people assume, well, you've got the active and the passive homosexual partner, but I think it's actually a little bit more nuanced than that. I think the one is referring to just people who engage in homosexuality. And then the, the other one, you could even say it refers to like the earliest form of transgenderism because you, you have people who are trying to act like women, but are in fact men. And uh, so they're confusing gender roles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now you, now you wrote this in oh, one after, article. I, I that, should finish oh, my, go my ahead, thought go ahead, there. Father. Yeah. Basically, St. Paul says these people are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And if you're a believer, not inheriting the kingdom of God is a pretty big thing. So if you love people that fall into those categories, and St. Paul doesn't say these people are forever damned if they fall into this. 
because he says, and such were some of you, but and it's in the past tense, such were some of you. So what St. Paul is clearly also teaching there is that these sins are not your identity. You know, if, if I was a drunkard, my identity wouldn't be I'm a drunkard. My, that would be my sin. That would be my weakness. Uh, but I, if I overcome it, I'm not a drunkard for the rest of my life. I'm someone who was a drunkard, but I'm not now. And the same thing would be true of someone who had fallen into homosexuality. You're not a homosexual if you're not engaged in homosexuality. If, if you you could be you could say you look honestly that you had been one. Uh, such were some of you, but uh, but it's not your identity. You're a Christian. And yeah. and if we love people and we believe what St. Paul says, uh, we want to see them be in the category of such were some of you, not the not the category of people who are, who are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Yeah, I don't want to go down this road, but um, where where the, the theoreticians on this subject would would push against you is that alcoholism drug addiction are not identities they consider this an identity so it is it's it's intricate intricately linked to who they are that's 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 the problem that it's very it's difficult to untangle it's it's not so much that's what they want to say but basically i think the reason why they make that argument is because the way that that homosexual, particularly homosexual men, have tried to justify uh, their behavior is to say, "I have no choice in this." Of course. Whereas, interestingly, you have lesbians that ha- take the opposite attitude that I choose to be a lesbian because I'm a feminist. You know, not that I have no choice in the matter. I wasn't born this way. I make the choice yeah. to, to be this. Uh, so, I, I think it's just a matter of people trying to justify. A sin, but I, I think that we have to base our identity on what the scriptures and the traditions tell us. And if you're a repentant homosexual, you're not a homosexual anymore. And you know, Father Seraphim Rose was a repentant homosexual, so he 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 he's not Father Seraphim Rose, the homosexual. He's Father Seraphim Rose, the repentant homosexual, the one who is no longer a homosexual. And the uh, and you know, God willing, and I, and I, and I certainly hope that He's glorified as a saint in my lifetime. I think that that would be a great saint for people. Even I think even now, people should, if they're struggling with this, should ask for his prayers. And uh, b- but uh, these things can be overcome, and He's not the only example in the history of church of people who've overcome such things. No, no, you're talking to one. And, yeah. um, <laughs> and I want to get into that in a minute, too. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Father Seraphim because I wasn't going to. Because it, it seems like it's a little bit of a sticky subject in Russian Orthodoxy about Father's past. I mean, it was it was the thing that drew me to him and that ultimately drew me to Russian Orthodoxy. So I'm, I'm glad that, that you said that. Thank you, Father. Yeah. Now, now you said in this the one article the fact that today we have people openly promoting the LGBTQ agenda in the Orthodox Church is something that was unthinkable less than a dozen years ago. I was surprised. So is that fairly new? Because this queer movement in the Catholic Church goes back at least into the sixties and seventies. So is, it, is right. it more is it more recent in in Orthodoxy? I think it's more recent. That's not to say there's never been anybody who was pushing it but i just never ran into or heard anybody on a popular level talking about it it was really only after obama got elected that you started hearing people talk about it and even then at first it was mostly anonymous people okay this is where i was reading this article and i was like fathers just dive in right in i love them homosexuality was considered a mental disorder by the American Psychiatric Association until 1973, when activists pushed the organization to change this designation. You're correct, Father. A lot of people don't know that. I mean, they remember 73 for Roe v. Wade, but um, it was also that year that it was declassified. And um, so that was the 
that was the status quo, I guess you could say, or the consensus among the psychiatric, psychological, you know, community that homosexuality was a mental disorder. And then suddenly it was not. And I, and, and I want to talk a little bit about that because I think that's caused a lot of problems and, and confusion. But thank you for jumping right in in this article and, and, and stating that. That's gonna make that, you, that got you in trouble, I'm, I'm sure. Because this is, I, I, I don't have examples from orthodoxy because I just don't see a lot. Um, but this is what um, uh, James Martin the now famous Jesuit said, and he said similar things, but, but, and I think there, there might be the, the troubling thing about orthodoxy is you don't want it to be downstream from Catholicism sometimes. So if you see this stuff going on in the Roman church, you don't want it popping up in orthodoxy. So he said, most reputable psychologists, psychiatrists, biologists, Social scientists say that people are simply born this way. He means gay. More importantly, I say the lived experience, which you had mentioned, of LGBT people, they'll tell you that they've always felt this way. And so to treat people differently because of the way that they were born, to say that they're inherently sinful or that they are inherently bad, I think is really doing a number on people. And now he's made some lies there because this is from the um, American Psychological Association, and this is recent, it's, it's still on their website. There is no consensus among scientists about the exact reasons that, it, that an individual develops a heterosexual, bisexual, gay or lesbian orientation. So, I mean, they even have to admit that the born gay theory is far from being proved, but, right. then, you ha- but then you have people pushing that that theory out there and religious people, religious. Right. And they, they push it because if somebody, if, if you convince people that people are born that way and they have no choice in the matter, then people obviously start thinking, well, how can we hold somebody accountable for something that they don't have any control over? Right. But while they haven't found the gay gene that makes somebody homosexual, they have yeah. found a gene that inclines people to become alcoholics. Have they but, really, Father? I didn't yeah, know that. I'm not aware of that. that. Then that that's not like an infallible prediction of who's going to be an al- alcoholic, but there is a genetic predisposition to being an alcoholic that some people have. Okay. And the thing of it is, if you get pulled over for drunk driving by the cops and you go in front of the judge and, and you say, well, I was born this way, they're going to lock you up. You know, they're, they're, they're not, they're, they're not going to accept that argument because the judge might say, yeah, you had a predisposition to be this, but you're still responsible. Or, you know, I could say, I, you know, I was, uh, you know, I, I have a, you know, Irish blood in me that makes me an angry person. You know, I'm a hothead. Well, maybe, maybe I, you know, I don't know if this is really something you could say is, is, is a certainty or anything, but if we accept just for the sake of argument that Irish people are predisposed to be hotheads, uh, that doesn't re- uh, relieve people who are Irish from the obligation to try to live a Christian life and to treat people in a Christian way and to control their anger. Uh, so just because you have a weakness in an area is not something that, uh, you know, means you have no choices. And uh, so even if there was such a gene that they found someday, it wouldn't prove that you have no choice in the matter. Correct. Just just to give people some facts here. Um, and th- when you were speaking of that letter that you responded to from the mother of a a gay a gay son, um, you know what? See, my questions start going. Well, number one, maybe the nun should have handled it this way. Number one, where's the boy's father? Right. Does the boy have any male? role models or any anybody in his life also has he been abused 46 percent. i repeat this on every every time i broach this topic because it's not discussed ever 46 percent of homosexual men in contrast to seven percent of heterosexual men 
reported homosexual molestations. Almost half of gay men use right. and that never gets talked about. So before we start talking about whether people are gay or not, let's see what's happened in their life first. And people, uh, and it's disturbing that people in religion do that. They just, they jump right over that. Right. And, you know, when you bring up the subject of pedophilia, homosexual act activists will immediately say, how dare you compare homosexuality with pedophilia? But if we accept for the sake of discussion that homosexuality is a sexual orientation, yeah. uh, what is pedophilia? Isn't that a sexual orientation? And, you know, I, I'm not an expert on the subject, but I certainly have heard that people who suffer or, or, or struggle with pedophilia have a hard time overcoming it. So if, if it's a sexual orientation, let's say that pe you could find the pedophile gene <laughs> and, and you could say these people are predisposed to be pedophiles. Is there any sane person today who would say, well, that means it's OK? I don't think so. Now, 20 years from now, I wouldn't bet on that because I think 20 years from now, there are probably going to be a lot of people arguing that pedophilia is OK. Yeah. Oh, they've already started. Yeah, with, yeah. with minor attracted people at, at the root of of I think the homosexual issue is childhood abuse. And when it is not treated, um, when the abu abuse is not treated, there is a there is an onset of heavy mental illness. And, right. you know, I, I don't want to waste your time by by going over the stats because it's all over my blog but right. um lgbt people have a much higher rates of mental illness suicidality uh, drug addiction alcoholism everything it's because there's a lot of untreated trauma there and and when these people get into a community there's sort of a trauma bond that's formed right and the thing is is a lot of people will say that maybe they have all these um, problems because of all the Christians that are putting guilt trips on them. But if you go to Holland or Sweden where you don't have the same kind of stuff, you find the same statistics. So, oh, right. it, yeah. It, so it really is. I mean, you know, the, you remember the friends don't let friends drive drunk. Friends sh don't, shouldn't let friends be uh, LGBTQ because Okay. They're more likely to die young. They're more likely to get cancer. They're more likely to be an alcoholic. They're more likely to be abused by their partners. I mean, homosexual men beat each other up all the time, and and lesbians do the same thing. I mean, it's the the abuse, the domestic abuse between those people is really huge, and part of that's because, and not to say that this never happens between husband and wife. Obviously, it does, but. Men and women have a natural balance of each other, whereas when you get two women together, correct, they don't balance each other out. The same thing with two men. Yeah, the the uh, the study that Father is referencing, just so people don't give you a hard time, uh, this was in the Netherlands. Homosexual Dutch men have much higher rates, and the, the, the Netherlands was the first country in the world to legalize same sex marriage, and they have a, a lot of legislative laws to protect you know homosexuals more so than other countries homosexual dutch men have much higher rates of mood disorders anxiety disorders and suicide attempts than heterosexual dutch men right that's, all, that's also the case in sweden too which is very um pro-gay um and christianity is almost off the radar screen uh, for the most part in the culture yeah yeah when you were talking about that nun, um, and you said that she'd come under the influence of a Jesuit. <laughs> um, whenever I, I've i gone down these queer theology rat holes, there's always a Jesuit. And I like this art article that you wrote because you named names. And one of the main uh, movers, uh, this pro- I don't know what to call it. This uh, queer theology in orthodoxy is this group at Fordham University. I wonder if you could talk about that. Fordham, of course, is a Jesuit. Oh. Right. <laughs> yeah, in Russian, I'm told that that there's a 
a word that even the KGB used to describe a low down snake in the grass backstabbing SOB. And it was Izuit. <laughs> what is that? Does that mean Jesuit? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so so if the KGB thinks the Jesuits are like the epitome of being a backstabbing, low down, uh, conniving uh, skunk, then I would say that that probably is something to that. <laughs> What is this 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 think tank or whatever at Fordham? Well, I I would love to know how much of our taxpayer dollars are for uh, are, are funding it because I suspect quite a few of them are. Uh, our our government, it, you know, is is actively trying to undermine the Orthodox Church. It's trying to divide the Orthodox Church oh. because because they think that the Russian uh, church gives uh, the Russian state a lot of influence beyond its borders and or other Orthodox countries. And so they're trying to divide the Orthodox church to undermine that. So that's, they actively promoted a schism in Ukraine uh, and uh, put the ecumenical patriarchate up to doing it even though he had previously been opposed to this group and, and said that they were totally schismatic the only legitimate church in Ukraine was the one under Metropolitan Anufri. And, um, but we know that since like 1950 something, uh, the Ecumenical Patriarchate has been under the thumb of the U.S. Uh, State Department. We, yeah. we have declassified uh, documents that establish that. Um, Patriarch Athenagoras was actually flown when he was elected Patriarch of Constantinople. He was flown on the forerunner to Air Force One, which uh, Harry Truman called the Holy Cow, from the United States, because he was the he, he was the Archbishop of the Greek Archdiocese in North America. He flew from on that plane to Constantinople, and uh, and the United States actively got rid of uh, one of his predecessors. I'm not sure if it was his immediate predecessor or not, because he was seen to be sympathetic with the Soviet Union. So our government's been interfering in the Orthodox Church for quite some time, but it's never been so brazen as to actively try to promote a schism. But that's what they're doing. We had, even under Trump, unfortunately, we had U.S. State Department people, including the Secretary of State and our ambassadors, traveling around to visit the heads of various local Orthodox churches to try to pressure them into recognizing this schism in Ukraine. So I, yeah. the idea that they would be funding Fordham University might seem far-fetched but i don't think that it is i it, it's probably being funded through you know other uh ngos that at least appear on the surface to not be related to the u.s government but um just to give you some idea how this stuff actually works father victor potopov uh is a rokor priest in washington dc he used to work for voice of america and hmm. uh, I, I read uh, something he wrote where he was talking about how he first had a job with a publishing company that went out of business, but it was actually a front for the CIA. It was it was publishing anti-Soviet materials, and I don't know if it was because of a change of administration that the funding got cut or what. But but he later found out that it was in fact a front for the CIA. So. Uh, so the CIA does all kinds of stuff like this, and it has for a long time. So it's not far fetched. I think that that's where they're getting the money from. No, it's not. And it and it and it, I didn't want to go down this pathway, but since you since you did, Father, it it seems like the LGBT issue is also at play in this sort of Ukraine Russia conflict. It's it's very odd. Our government is pushing that too, and and that's kind of a litmus test. You know, Patriarch Kirill has been criticized for a lot of what he said since the Russians got more actively involved in this, although the war has been going on for nine years now. Mm -hmm. uh, and and people, most people don't know that. Yeah. But and I think some of the stuff he said, he probably shouldn't have said. But one of the things he was criticized for saying, I think is absolutely true, is that having gay pride parades and promoting the whole LGBTQ agenda is uh, is a litmus test for loyalty to the the new world order for you know, yeah. you're pro NATO if you're if you're waving the pride flag and you're not if you're opposed to it. I think he's right. I think he's right. Yep. Um, in in the West, we saw this 
in Ireland, which was the bastion of Catholicism. And it's mm -hmm. it, it's kind of fascinating now to watch Poland, which which sort of took that banner from Ireland, and now it's it's slowly <laughs> it's slowly being Western. I don't know how to say it. It's, it's being Westernized, and um, the, yeah. the 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 church is collapsing there, and it's all <laughs> going south really yeah. fast. Yeah. I don't pay as much attention to what goes on in the Roman Catholic Church as I do as what goes on in the Orthodox Church. Of course. But, but I suspect it's probably true because we do know that our CIA, when they started using the mafia uh, to help uh, monitor like uh, our ports during World War II, they also started adopting a lot of mafia tactics in terms of how to control people. And one of those is blackmail. And uh, so it, it would not surprise me one bit if a lot of the pedophilia stuff and also some of the changes you've been seeing in the Roman Catholic Church have been driven by that kind of stuff. And it's and it, I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know this. I wouldn't be surprised if Pope Francis uh, became pope and Benedict was forced to resign because our government wanted it to be so. And And maybe it was this very issue that was one of those issues that that pushed them or the the key issue that pushed them i wouldn't doubt it <laughs> yeah now you mentioned something in this article which is um important and you talk about a lot of times a lot of times when someone of good faith tries to let's say something like me talk to the queer theologians um you know, they always emphasize the need for dialogue. We want dialogue with the church, dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. What they mean, but what they mean by dialogue, and I think you'll probably agree, is they want you to change your mind. Exactly. You to change. They are not willing to have a dialogue with me about my more traditional stance. They want to talk to me and force me to change my mind. Yeah, you know, basically they'll they, they'll dialogue, dialogue, dialogue until they wear you down and you cave. But after they they win, they don't dialogue. You don't you don't see the Episcopal Church dialoguing on this issue anymore. They're now that they've got control over the um, institutions. If they're dealing with a bishop or a priest who takes positions that they don't like, they'll crush them. They'll start they'll start appealing to the authority of the bishop. And you know how dare you you know you know, go against what the church teaches? So th they're they're totally intolerant once they get in power. But when they're not in power, they're all about tolerance and having discussions. But it's uh, you know come come into the parlor, said the spider to the fly. That's that that's the kind of dialogue that they want to have. Yeah, I've I've had discussions with LGBT people who are secular, secularly minded. And most of them are, um, I always say most of them claim to be spiritual, but not religious, meaning they have some sort of spirituality in their life, but they don't belong to an organized religion. That's the vast majority. Right. And, but when I have tried to have a conversation with queer Catholics, not queer orthodox but i have had conversations with like queer christians and things like that it's very difficult it's much worse than the secular because you know they buy into the born gay stuff but they took it a step further which is well god made me this way and you know god has given me certain gifts that as a homosexual that i have and that if you are going against me and my identity, you're going against God. And that's where it gets really um, pretty vicious. So these, these I don't want to say these people, but a lot of times people that do ad identify with this sort of queer theory, queer Catholic, queer Christian, whatever, are very difficult to reach. The most difficult to reach that I, I found. I found. Well, unfortunately, you have a wing of uh, people among Protestants and some Roman Catholics and even some people in the Orthodox Church that buy into this, these reinterpretations of 
scriptural prohibitions against homosexuality. And they try to say, well, that's not talking about the kind of homosexuality that we have today, or St. Paul's only condemning pederast Mm -hmm. and and, um, that sort of stuff. And, And you even have some translations of the Bible now that are even mainstream that are, that are, obscuring what the scriptures actually say by caving into this agenda and using words like, uh, you know, temple prostitute or uh, pederast, whatever. Um, And that's not what these words say. And and, and there's no reason to believe that these translations are accurate. Because you know what? There's a very good word in Greek for pederast, and that's pederast. That's where the word comes from. And so if St. Paul was talking about pederast, uh, then he would use that word. Aye, aye, aye. Um, I want to talk about that because you wrote a separate article about um, uh, the Bible and homosexuality. I wanted to just finish with this one article, and I'll, I'll post the links to these articles in the description. You wrote, this was kind of disheartening. I hope I am wrong, but I believe that we are witnessing the unfolding of a full-blown schism it will not just be over abortion or over the LGBTQ agenda or over the other issues we will be looking at, but each of these are pieces to the larger puzzle. This, yeah, because and I don't want orthodoxy to be downstream from Catholicism because I, I think Catholicism right now is in the midst of this. If you look at what, like what Germany is doing, Germany just said, I mean, they essentially said, we're going to have gay marriages, whether the Vatican likes it or not. And they have posted pictures and we're doing it. So. It was interesting is you probably heard about that Roman Catholic priest who's pro-life, who was just defrocked. I, I, I know him. I don't know him well, Father Pavoni, but I right. did. Yeah. Yeah. So he was defrocked because he maybe made a few over the stop, top statements about uh, people who were uh, pro-abortion. And yet you've got uh, German bishops that are approving gay marriages or blessings of gay marriages. The, the Vatican has the exact same powers to defrock those people as it used in this case. But for some reason, they, they didn't have a problem defrocking a pro-life priest. But they haven't pulled the trigger on the pro-homosexuals. And uh, that tells you everything you need to know right there. I think Pope Francis probably only is not happy with these bishops because they're moving too fast. He would like them to go a little slower. I think you're right. Uh, but uh, but they're, they're heading in the same direction. But the advantage the Orthodox Church has is that we are decentralized, except for God. You know, God is a central, a central organizing uh, power in the Orthodox Church. In the Roman Catholic Church, the Pope is the the head, you know, the Greek saying that the fish rots from the head down. Uh, Having one guy who gets to decide how everything's going to be has certain advantages administratively. You know, the Roman Catholic Church can do a lot of things faster than the Orthodox Church can do because the Pope can just say this is how it's going to be. But the problem is when the Vatican becomes a corrupt, uh, you know, nest of pedophile uh, you know, anti-God, uh, uh, near, near close to, you know, semi-atheist. And uh, there's no remedy for that <laughs> because who's, who's going to fix it? No. Uh, because the, because the, the Pope is the central organizing uh, power in the Roman Catholic Church. And if he's already corrupt and everything around him is corrupt, it's just not fixable. Whereas in the Orthodox Church, Every local church has its own primate, yeah. and if one church goes off the rails, like Patriarch Bartholomew's seems to be intent on doing right now, the rest of the church has the authority to say, hey, we're not going along with you. You're wrong. And they can call them to account. They can call them to repent, and then either Patriarch Bartholomew repents or he doesn't. If he doesn't repent, he gets cut off, and the rest of the Orthodox Church keeps chugging on down the track. And probably a significant portion of the people who today are under the ecumenical patriarchate will wind up leaving that that group because they don't want to go along for the ride, and they will be in communion with us. And uh, I, I'm afraid that's exactly what's going to wind up happening. I hope we have a happier ending than that. 
but you know god prunes his vine and uh you know when you have people who want to go off in that direction it's better to have them cut off than to have them remain in the church and poison everything else it, it looks like that happened a bit father with oca over this this covid yeah lockdowns it i mean just from talking to some people it looked like some people came to the rural core over that we have a lot of parishes that you know, are now in Rokor that were started by people who were unhappy with their local OCA bishop. Okay. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to give the bishop some, you know, leeway because I understand that at first it wasn't clear what we were really dealing with. And I can't put myself in the position of a bishop who is being told by epidemiologist that he's you know had as his parishioners you know all their lives and uh and they come to him and say look if you don't do something you're gonna have dead people all over the diocese i could see why a bishop being given that information might say you know what i got to do something drastic here uh but at a certain point those bishops should have started to say hey there's more going on here than than that because this is not what they said it was going to be no, no. Uh, so I'm not as concerned about what bishops did on the front end as a, as I am about what bishops did far into this. But even those bishops, I would say, you know, if they've seen the light, even after at the end of it, you know, let's give them some slack. But yeah. but certainly, we we got to see a lot about what people really believed as a result of COVID. Yep. And uh, you know, if you really believe that the Eucharist is the body and blood of Christ. Uh, and <laughs> yes. you weren't concerned about getting sick from taking communion exactly and if you were concerned about getting sick from taking communion then that ought to cause you to reassess your faith because you had some weaknesses that need to be dealt with yeah yeah it's it, it's it requires because i'm a i'm a bit of a hypochondriac so it does require a leap of faith and it's it's um you just gotta right. put your your hands in in god one of the this article that i want to i've already had you almost for an hour um, that you talked about the Bible and homosexuality. Um, the the main, I have to say, the main theory with with queer um, theologians is that the Bible that you have to look at Bible through a historical context, right? Um, meaning that um, there were things in the Bible said about slavery. Um, the treatment of women, certain dietary admonitions that Christians do not follow anymore. There, I'm not saying as they're saying. Therefore, these this condemnation of homosexual activity is is historically land you know locked into that Judaic worldview which is not um, where we are now. And that's how you have to look at these um, Bible passages. Right. That's the argument that they make, but they're disingenuous arguments. <laughs> uh, I, I have another article that you may or may not have seen, but it's called uh, the, the uh, sh uh, Shrimp and Homosexuality. <laughs> Uh, but it, it's dealing with the whole argument. Well, look, you eat shrimp, so homosexuality must be okay because the Bible says that shrimp is an abomination. Well, um, God never judged the nations because they were eating shrimp. You know, God didn't kick the the Canaanites out of the land of promise because they were eating shrimp. That was part of the ceremonial law, and. Uh, and there are different words that are both translated in many translations as abomination in Hebrew, and they mean different things. So basically, when it talks about shrimp being an abomination to the Jews, it's saying this is something that you can't have. Exactly. Because under the law, there are certain things you can eat and there are certain things you can't eat. And, and so we could go into why that it was ever a thing, but uh, you know, it had some symbolic meaning. And in a certain sense, it was kind of like fasting is to us. It's yeah. a way of learning to say no to certain things 
so that you learn how to say no to bigger things. Uh, exactly. But um, but God held the Gentiles to account for certain things, and sexual morality was one of those. And so when you read, if you look at the passage in Leviticus where it, you find the list of immoral sexual relationships, it's preceded by condemnation of the Gentiles. You don't do these things because the people in the land did these things, and that's yes. why God is casting them out. Yes. And it, and it ends, and it's, it kind of repeats the same idea. So it's book-ended with these two observations that God judged these Gentiles uh, because they did these things, and so therefore you shall not do these things. And if you fast forward to Acts chapter 15, where the apostles were trying to figure out what do we do with Gentiles who want to become Christians, obviously if Christ had told them what to do, they wouldn't have had to have a council. Christ didn't tell them, hey, when the Gentiles start coming, you can let them only do these things. But we're told in Acts chapter 15 that when they wrote their decree, they said it seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit to do this. And what they determined was that Gentiles are not uh, required to adhere to the ceremonial law of Moses, but they are required to, to adhere to the laws against sexual immorality, they can't eat or drink blood. And, you know, they, they, that, you know, they, they have to remember the poor, you know, there, there, there are certain things that Gentiles are held responsible for. And if you go back to Genesis chapter nine, you see basically the covenant that God made with Noah. Hmm. And Noah, of course, is the, is the forefather of all the humans that survived the flood, which would be all of us. And, uh, in, in, that, in Genesis 9, Noah was told, you can eat of any herb or any creature. So Gentiles were not required to abstain from unclean animals like you find in the, in the Mosaic law. But Gentiles were always held accountable to things like not murdering people, not robbing from people, and uh, you know, not engaging in immoral sexual relations. And so the apostles decreed in Acts chapter 15 that Gentiles m must abstain from fornication is the way the King James translates it. And the word in Greek is porneia, and it means it refers to any kind of sexual immorality, any, any unlawful sexual activity. And, uh, and so the way that would have been understood by the apostles and the way the church has always understood it, is that all those immoral sexual relations that are described in Leviticus apply to Gentiles just as well as they did to the Jews, that we're all held accountable to those things. But we're not, we can eat all the shrimp we want. <laughs> and, 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 and it doesn't, that, the, the, the two are not comparable in any respect. Okay, okay. You, you wrote this, any priest who suggests that homosexual sex is not inherently sinful and must be repented of is in fact, heretic i love that um yep. unfortunately there's a lot of such people like that um yep. the the thing that i want to get your reaction to this the thing that i'm very hopeful about orthodoxy as a new convert is that um in roman catholicism this is from richard sype who was an ex-priest and he was featured in the movie um spotlight um through his research, he found that probably about 50% of Roman Catholic priests are homosexual. So what happens there in that space is that the priests, you know, who are gay um, are naturally drawn to this ministry because they, they have a personal investment in it. Um, where I'm hopeful in orthodoxy is that you don't have, I, you don't have anywhere near that number of, of 50 <laughs> of, of gay priests, so I, you know, I don't think it will get the traction that it has in Roman Catholicism because you have so many priests, um, bishops, I would, you know, prelates, cardinals that are personally invent, invested in this issue. Right. I think part of the reason why you have such a high number of homosexuals in the Roman Catholic Church today, it's a combination of factors. One of them is, is that it used to be particularly prior to Vatican II, that 
although it was obviously a sacrifice for a young man to decide I'm going to be a priest and I'm going to remain celibate for the rest of my life. There was a compens compensatory respect that he was given by society that looked, you're, you're making a sacrifice for the rest of us. And we appreciate that. Whereas today that's not how they're viewed. I mean, when you see a Roman Catholic priest, you get snide remarks. I mean, I often get snide remarks on Twitter and other social media because people assume when they see Father John Whiteford that I'm a Roman Catholic. And those, so they start talking about, uh, you know, Pete Priest being a bunch of pedophiles and they think I'm a celibate. And I tell them, look, I've been married for, you know, 35 years and I've got, you know, kids and grandkids. So, you know, you're, you're barking at the wrong tree. But uh, the, the beard is a dead is a dead giveaway, though, Father. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> but the, the other thing is that you have a homosexual culture in a lot of seminaries, particularly in America. And so if you have somebody who decides, even under all the circumstances of contemporary society, they still want to be a priest, and they're not a homosexual, but they go to one of these seminaries, they're drummed out in many cases because they're seen as a threat. Right. And uh, so they're made to feel uncomfortable. And I think the Roman Catholic Church would probably solve a lot of their problems in this area if they simply allowed married men to become priests like we do. Uh, but uh, but anyway, we do. And uh, and so in the Orthodox Church, typically, if you want to be a monastic, you, you, you can become a monastic. And if you, uh, we have monastic clergy, but they typically serve in monasteries. The exception, obviously, is bishops are taken from the monastics, but bishops are also supposed to be taken from the best of the monastics, the most spiritual. And uh, I don't think we have anything like the problem they have. I mean, obviously, there's there have been some, yeah. but uh, you know, I, I think that uh, it, it's certainly not anything in the, in the same ballpark. Because basically, if you want to be a clergyman in the Orthodox Church. And you want to also be married. You have an outlet. Yep. So, uh, and if you and if you want to be a celibate, you also have an outlet. And then there's a filtering process before you would ever be considered to be a bishop. So there's a way to deal with people who maybe went into monasticism because they were struggling with homosexuality, which certainly is a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can understand why someone who was struggling with homosexuality would see monasticism as a way to deal with it. And and that, I don't think that that's a wrong thing. Yeah, uh, but somebody like that probably ought to not be made a bishop. No, if if it's a weakness for them. Yeah, yeah. Two more points I want to get to before I uh, let you go, Father. I kept you too long. Now this is this is you writing now. If because I I, I like this point you're making because and I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but I'm I'm asking you what you're thinking. Um, you know, when I discuss this topic with people, you know, I'm not like, well, you cannot believe this way or, or you can't, uh, you know, subscribe to these queer theories, queer theology. I don't believe it. But what you wrote here is now, if you wish to say that you simply reject the teachings of the scriptures and the church, at least you are being honest with yourself. But please don't patronize us by pretending these teachings are not clear. So, I mean, I, and I've said that to people, maybe I was wrong to say that um, in the Catholic milieu. I was like, you know what? Be an Episcopalian. Go to the United Church of Christ. I mean, they will accept all this stuff. But, you know, why? I, I think there's a different agenda there. It's, yeah. it's, it's not that they just want acceptance because they could have that. It's it's more destructive than that. It's like you don't believe me. You don't subscribe to what I'm saying. Therefore, I'm going to force you to. I can understand why people are tempted to say, "Why don't you become an Episcopalian?" But the thing is, if I'm talking to an Orthodox Christian, I I would never say, "Well, hey, go be an Episcopalian." Of course, Father. Because, because if they took me up on it, I wouldn't want to be responsible for the for the spiritual results that would ensue. I'm going to tell them they need to repent of their, their false beliefs. But I agree with you. I think that the, that the reason why they don't leave when they could obviously be clergy and be celebra celebrated in these other churches is they want to force people to accept them. And 
if you go back into the 70s when the gay rights movement really got started you had homosexuals and their argument at the time was hey just leave us alone we want to do what we want to do now they won't leave us alone yeah and and that's exactly right uh, it's not th- th- because the thing is even though society is leaving them alone and they're allowed to do what they want to do they're still not happy and they somehow think they're going to be happy when everybody's is, is applauding you know you're 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 a wonderful people it's all okay the thing is they're still not going to be happy it's kind of like you know when people think that the you know they want to be a man wants to be a woman and they think well when i get the surgery i'm going to be happy no the thing is their suicide rates actually shoot up after the surgery because even though all their plumbing has been altered and they look like a woman at least to some extent um they're still not happy because the, the problem is not their plumbing. The problem, the problem is a spiritual problem, and and it can only be cured with a spiritual cure, and it can't be a worldly one. It has to be a spiritual one, a Christian one. It's like I keep hitting this point over and over again. There's something deeper and darker going on. Right. There's there's a deep psychological wound, and I think it's trauma. Um, right. th- this is this is where you really hit it here. But I mean, you do throughout the article. What is also clear is that we have, I had to laugh at this because this is, was my experience in Catholicism. What is also clear here is that we have a small group of modernists who, for whatever sentimental reasons, like to dress up in Orthodox vestments and sing some of the hymns of the church, but who love neither truth, the church, nor its tradition. That's that's so true. It, it you can put on the trappings of a religion, but if the truth of that religion does not reside in your heart, it's all false. Right. <laughs> and that's, I mean, basically, people who go down that road, they're on the road to embracing the religion of the Antichrist. I mean, that, that's where they're going to wind up. It's not going to be orthodoxy. They're not going to hijack the orthodox faith because... Christ is the head of the church, and uh, his church is not going to be uh, assailed by hell. It's it's going to prevail. What what it what? I guess this is my kind of my final question to you, Father, because I I try to give people the the benefit of the doubt. I think you've already answered it, but but I often ask myself the question: Why do these people stay in in this religion? where they're diametrically opposed to many of the teachings. What What is the purpose? I think it's a deep psychological need they have for acceptance that they didn't get, I think, in the case of gay men from their father. Right. And um, you you are a father figure. You're called father. The church is, is a figure of authority like that. So I think sometimes they think that if they can get that acceptance, they'll kind of reach that nexus. And and I think you kind of address that when people kind of change everything maybe about themselves. And then they think that everything will be okay, but it's not. Yeah, because they're barking up the wrong tree. Uh, You know, that's not the that's not the cure that they're searching for. You know, I, I think that the, there's lots of reasons why people have views on this that are at variance with the church. And I would say on the one end of the spectrum, you could have people who honestly never understood that the church had a clear teaching on this. And maybe they heard people who sounded like they knew what they were talking about that said that it was okay and they bought into it innocently. Mm. Uh, and you also have, and, I, I, and some of these priests that have, have started spouting some of this nonsense i know for a fact that they were very traditionally minded or at least the way they talked they were at one time but then they had children who became homosexuals oh. and i think that there's i can certainly sympathize with them as a father wanting to not reject their children but uh you can still love your children and say that what they're doing is wrong. I mean, if I had a child, if I had a child that became, you know, Charles Manson, I would still love him 
but I would never affirm, you know, the Charles Manson lifestyle. I would have to say that was wrong, Chuck. Uh, but, uh, but I would still love him and I would try to use whatever influence I had to bring him to repentance up until the end. That's what, you know, what a parent's supposed to do. Uh, so I sympathize with them, but that's the wrong solution. Uh, and then you, you obviously have people who are actively struggling with the sin and trying to find some way to justify it. And then I think you even have people who are, have more evil motives than that, that are actively trying to destroy yep. the truth because the truth is an offense to them. Yeah. With, with the parents of a, of a gay kid, what I've seen is a lot of avoidance and it's easier for them to say, well, my son or my daughter was born this way rather, rather than confronting maybe the issues in the family that might've contributed the right. dysfunction in the family that might've contributed to the kid being homosexual that they right. don't want, you know, that they don't want to discuss. And I have to right. say, father, what's great and I want to, because I kept you too long, what's one of the great things about orthodoxy that I have found is that I think the best way to convert people or to catechize them or to teach them the truths of the Christian faith is through example. And I've seen in orthodoxy, not that everybody's the same, but I've seen in orthodoxy a lot of good people, clerics and lay people that are just good good men, good people. And that's just a good example to living a, a healthy Christian life. Right. Right. Thank you, Father. Thank you. And thank you for tackling this subject. I I know from doing research on you on the internet that you've received some incoming fire, <laughs> you know. and A little and bit, that, yeah. You, no, quite a bit. <laughs> a lot i would say so so thank you for taking this head on because they'll certainly attack you because they've attacked me and um so so thank you because it's 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 a suffering it's kind of like a white martyrdom that that you've taken on so so thank yeah. you right well you're welcome the way I look at it is if it's if I don't believe in the truth, then I'm wasting my time. But if I do believe in the truth, then I have to will, be willing to go to the mat for it. Uh, well, thank you. You certainly have. Can can you offer a blessing for me and for anybody anybody watching? Could you do that? Thank you. Sure. May the Lord bless you and keep you and shine his face upon you and, and cause you to walk in his paths and, and strengthen you in the faith. God bless. I mean, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father.